So the question I want to start with is where are all the baryons in the universe? Where can we find them? So asking a question, of course, with a word in there that not everyone probably knows. I should probably ask the question, what are baryons? That I can tell you. Baryons are just normal material. They're the stuff that make up you and me and everything in this room. Everything that you can see pretty much is a baryon. Uh, other particles in the universe, neutrinos, which are massless and travel near the speed of light, which come from the sun and act with galactic nuclei and all sorts of energetic processes, are not baryons. Electrons are not baryons. And the light that actually carries the information that we see, photons, are not actually baryons. But the things that are emitting those baryons, or emitting those photons, are baryons. So you can think of baryons as just the normal stuff in our map in the universe, normal stuff that makes up you and me. Unfortunately, this normal stuff that we're very familiar with is only about 4 or 5% of everything in the universe. Everything else, the other 96%, is dark matter and dark energy. And as I always like to say about things astronomers don't understand is that if we don't understand it, we just call it dark. <laughs> we don't know what it is. We know something about it, but we don't actually, you know, we know something about how it behaves, but we don't actually know what it is. So baryons are normal material, and over the history of the universe, we've known something about where they are at different points in time. So there's a brief uh, schematic of the history of the universe, according to NASA at least, uh, with the WMAP satellite, uh, the present day on the right, Big Bang on the left. And I use this to illustrate the expansion of the universe, but also, in particular, at the bottom here, the time. So the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. And I'm going to spend most of this talk not talking about the age of the universe or what's happening at different times, but what's happening as a function of what we call redshift. Redshift is sort of an inverse time. It's a, if you do one over time, that's roughly a, a redshift. So the present day is redshift zero. It's where we are right now, it's the zero point, the origin, if you will. And the Big Bang is a redshift of infinity. And if you look about half the age of the universe back, you get to a redshift of about 1.4. Uh, we use this in part because it's just a simple way that we actually observe things. And as opposed to trying to untrain myself and, use, and avoid slipping into jargon, I'm just going to tell you what the jargon is. Um, but I'll occasionally bring up time as well. So if we put the history of the universe here in a more uh, linear fashion, we have the Big Bang at the top, the present day at the bottom, with the uh, grandiose statement that astronomers figure it all out, uh, which we don't. We haven't yet, at least, maybe tomorrow. Um, and we have times here on the left. So at 300,000 years after the Big Bang, that's when we see the cosmic microwave background, the point in time where light first freely streamed through the universe. Uh, after that, the universe was mostly neutral uh, and opaque. Light couldn't freely stream through it again for a bit, because it get, kept getting absorbed by hydrogen. Uh, that hydrogen started to collapse into structures, forming stars and galaxies. Those stars and galaxies ionized the hydrogen, separated the electron from the proton, and the universe uh, became a lot less dense and a lot more like it is today with stars and galaxies and such. Uh, and over about the past uh, 12 billion years or so, the universe has certainly changed in appearance, but the basic structures have all been there. Putting this in context of redshift, the cosmic wave background somewhere around a redshift of 1,000, stars and galaxies were forming somewhere between redshifts of about 12 and 20-ish. Uh, redshift of a half is about when the solar system would have formed, and uh, redshift of zero, of course, is today. In terms of the baryons, in terms of the normal matter in the universe, we know from the studies of the cosmic microwave background that at the time uh, that the universe first became uh, transparent, that the universe was 74% of the baryons, at least that 4.5%. 74% of that's hydrogen, 24% of it's helium, and then there were trace amounts of heavier things like deuterium and lithium. Um, because you hadn't had stars yet, there weren't things like iron and carbon and oxygen, the stuff that were much more, uh, much more commonly encountered today. By a redshift of about three, 
we know from observations, which I'll talk about in a bit, that most of these baryons in the universe are sitting in intergalactic beam. And they're mostly hydrogen as well. By the present day, however, we're missing about half of them, about 40% of them. We don't know exactly where they are. We think we know where they are, but we haven't actually observationally seen them. So this is the cosmic microwave background. These are hot and cold spots on it. This is all pretty much exactly 3 degrees Kelvin or 2.7 degrees Kelvin uh, down to the micro Kelvin level. These hot and the cold spots, the blue and the uh, red spots, are variations at sort of the micro Kelvin level. So this is a very smooth surface. It's a perfect black body uh, radiator. And these hot and cold spots are the seeds that are going to form galaxies and galaxy clusters and groups and so on and so forth. If you go to smaller and smaller scales, you would eventually see the seeds of stars and things like that. But these are on the larger scales, so you're talking about galaxies and groups of galaxies and the like. So that's what the universe looked like at 300,000 years. After that, as structures started to form, you got this filamentary pattern of material. Structures forming sort of filaments. And where the filaments run into each other, you get groups or clusters of galaxies. And this slide is showing you roughly what the intergalactic medium looks like as traced by neutral hydrogen. And at a redshift of three, looking back <coughs> a few years before the Big Bang, or after the Big Bang, um, most all of the baryons are in this intergalactic medium. We think that today, about 90% of the baryons are in sort of a warm to hot phase. When I talk about warm and hot and temperatures, this is a very skewed sense of temperature. Uh, warm to hot, I mean sort of 100,000 up to maybe a million degrees Kelvin. So I don't tend to think normally that people think of 100,000 degrees Kelvin as only warm, but... <laughs> um, it's better than uh, people who refer to cold as about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. So it's a relative sense of temperature. So we think that's where they are today, but it's not particularly well constrained by observations. The way we trace this is by observing hydrogen. And there are two ways we can observe hydrogen. We can observe it by seeing it absorb light from behind it, and we can observe it emitting light directly. And at a high redshift, the easiest way to observe it is in absorption. And so what happens is you have a bright background source that's emitting the spectrum of light. It encounters a hydrogen atom, absorbs that orangish color there, and it arrives to us, and we see absorption. That, uh, that electron going around the proton there, and that hydrogen atom, uh, when that light hits it, the electron jumps up. So we're about to see it to do again to a higher energy level. That's the absorption process. But then, at some point, we'll drop back down, right about there, and emit light in a very distinct wavelength of 121.6 nanometers. Um, this is in the ultraviolet. And that's where you would see emission of that light in the ultraviolet. It's unfortunately very hard to see that emission. It's difficult to observe things in the ultraviolet, even in absorption. But absorption is a very sensitive probe, otherwise, of hydrogen. And that's because the amount of absorption doesn't depend on how far away something is from it. If we observe a bright background source, like the spectrum shows here, what you see is that bump around 6,500 angstroms, or 650 nanometers. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Um, and that little bump is associated with a quasar that's emitting light. And all of that noise, effectively, to the left of it, our absorption lines from clouds, small clouds of hydrogen between us and the quasar. And they're all different wavelengths going off to the blue side of things because they're at different redshifts. There are different distances between us and that quasar. There's nothing to the right of it because that's where the quasar is, and so things that would be redder from that would be things that are beyond the quasar, and you can't see absorption from something that's on the other side of the flashlight, effectively. So we know a few, we can divide these absorption lines into a few different regimes. There are damped line and alpha absorption lines. These are very high column density clouds of gas, a lot, a lot of material. Uh, these come from galaxies, and these are these big broad lines that you see sort of sitting around 6,000 angstroms there, or maybe 5,700, the sort of wide places where you don't see much absorption, you just see a single deep line. And that's from the outskirts of the galaxy. 
There are what are called Lyman limit systems, which are slightly lower column densities, 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 20 um, atoms per square centimeter. To put that in perspective, the air in this room is about 10 to the 19 atoms per cubic centimeter. Okay, so in a galaxy here, these absorption lines are coming from the same amount of air that's in a single centimeter in the sort of cubic centimeter in this room, but one square centimeter spread throughout the entire length of the galaxy. Okay, it's practically a perfect vacuum, uh, but we can still observe it. Um, this is gas, these Lyman limits, Lyman limits systems. Uh, this gas is presumably associated with the outskirts of galaxies and around it. Uh, but then most of these lines, most of these just very narrow lines that are scattered throughout everything, throughout the entire spectrum uh, southward of 6,000 angstroms there, are really low columnists, below 10 to the 17. Very diffuse gas. And these are, this gas is mostly ionized, most of the cases where the electron is split off from the proton. And almost all of it has got to be in the intergalactic medium. I mentioned that you see the different absorption lines at different redshifts. This is an example of that. There's the quasar. You've got these three uh, clouds of gas there between, at different distances between the Earth and the quasar. And they each produce the absorption line, the most distant ones furthest to the red, the closest ones furthest to the blue. And so you can tell where one of these clouds is based on its redshift. You can tell how deep from how deep the line is, how much hydrogen is there. And when we do this, we can kind of put together a history of where the gas is or how, and how much gas there is as a function of redshift. So we have redshift at the bottom here going from 3 on the left to 0 on the right. Astronomers love plotting their graphs backwards. Um, and then the <coughs> amount of mass by fraction uh, on the y-axis. And we can directly observe this um, warmish gas, this gas around 10 to the 5, that's that orangish dots going from the top down. This pointer is working now, so it's the, the line going down from 90% down to about 40% uh, at zero redshift. And that's being traced by the Lyman alpha absorption line. Uh, today, the amount of gas that's in galaxies has gone up as the blue line, blue squares at the bottom. There's some hot gas that seems to be more common, that's in galaxy clusters, we think. But the bulk of the gas, the stuff that's marking either red or black there, the red circles of the black triangles, is warm to hot <coughs> gas. And here, hot is up to 10 to the 7, so warm to hot is around a million. Um, again, a kind of a skewed view of that in my mind, but we think that's covering about half the gas that's out there in the universe. But again, we don't really have a good, strong, clean detection of that. We, are basically piecing that together from what we know is in the other phases. So that's kind of an idea, a rough idea of where we think baryons are. I want to narrow this question down a little bit more, though, go a little bit deeper into something that I'm more directly researching. And that is this hydrogen content I'm showing you, this effectively the green line down at the bottom, which is only maybe 10% of the baryons today. How has that changed with time? How has the hydrogen content of galaxies changed with time over the history of the universe? This is an important question because while we know that star formation rate, which is the graph on the right, uh, is a function of redshift and it's a function of time on the top there, we know the shape of that curve over a wide range of redshifts pretty darn well. And you can see it, it's peaking at a redshift of around 2. And by the day, it's dropped by about a factor of 10. Now, I want to point out that the axis on that, that rightmost graph is a log axis. That means each unit on there corresponds to a power of 10. Okay. So you've got a factor of 10 change in the rate at which stars have been forming in galaxies over the past 8 to 10 billion years. It's a quite a, a dramatic drop. The material that these stars are forming out of, however, is the neutral hydrogen. If you look at the neutral hydrogen content of galaxies, you should see a delay. You should see sort of a similar shape, but it's going to be shifted somewhat, right? There's going to be a huge amount of content, and then as you increase the rate at which you're forming stars, you're going to use up the gas that you're forming them out of very rapidly, <laughs> and then 
you should be running out of them. Unfortunately, if you look at the graph on the right, while the error bars are very large on this, so we don't know these numbers very well, just look at the y-axis there. That's a linear scale. So each unit there is effectively, if you're going from uh, 0.5 to 1, that's a factor of 2. If you go from 0.5 to 1.5, which is sort of the full range of those data points, it's a factor of 3. It's not a factor of 10. Okay, astronomers tend to hand wave a lot, and we kind of assume we've got things pretty well under control if we get them within a factor of 10. But there's definitely a difference between a factor of 3 and a factor of 10. Those are two different ranges. And you could imagine that the evolution goes something like that, connecting the zero redshift point, today's point, with the most distant mark there uh, at around 3, 3.5. And you can see a linear change, again, of about a factor of three. What this means, effectively, is if you imagine you're set out on a car trip, and you're going to drive from here to San Francisco, and you start out with a full tank of gas here, and when you arrive in San Francisco, you still have a full tank of gas. What did you do on the way? You had to stop and buy gas, right? <laughs> you had to get gas. And so these galaxies have to be getting gas at some point in there. And they have to be continuously getting gas. Either that or you have a broken gas gauge. Um, and there is some truth to that, too. H1 is not the immediate material that gap stars form out. It's just the ultimate material. Um, so the problem we have here is these data points in the middle that are around a redshift of 1 have these huge error bars on We don't really understand in detail how the hydrogen content in galaxies is changing between the present day. We know it really well right now, and we know it OK at high redshift, but we don't know it very well in the middle. So we want to understand that better in order to understand the connection between the graph on the left and the graph on the right. So to do that, most of these data points, I should say, on the left here, come from neutral hydrogen absorption. And that can be tricky because you need a background source. You need a flashlight shining through the material to see the, the gas through the absorption. You can't see it everywhere. And you only get that pencil beam of information, only something that's on a direct line of sight between you and that background source. You know how much gas there is. If you move a slight bit off of it, you don't know anything about it. You don't have this problem if you observe the gas in emission. And hydrogen has probably the most common uh, emission of any, or of any atom sorry, um, in the universe. And it just happens because you have a proton that has some spin associated with it, and you have an electron that has some spin associated with it. And if those spins are aligned, that is, they're both spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, and an easier demo to do if I had two left hands or two right hands, but imagine my hands are curving in the same way. They're both spinning, sort of their north poles pointing up. That's a higher energy state than if one of them is flipped the other way, <coughs> and it's spinning with its north pole pointing down. And you can see on this animation here that when that flip happens, the spin flips, it emits light. And it emits it at a very precise frequency of 21 centimeters or 1420.405752 megahertz. Uh, we know it very precisely. Uh, this was predicted by a Dutch student in 1944. The Dutch, the Australians, and the Americans all went after this, trying to observe it. Uh, the Dutch were sort of in the lead, and then they had a fire in their lab, which prevented them from seeing it. And the Americans uh, managed to be the first to the post. What's remarkable about this is if you look at a given hydrogen atom, it will roughly transition once every 11 million years. Okay, I don't know how many hydrogen atoms are in this room, but there's going to be a few. And it's going to be a long time before you see a 21 centimeter photon coming from one of those atoms, because there are not that many. But because there are so many atoms per square centimeter in a galaxy, there are about 10 to the 20, that means you've got, in a square centimeter in the galaxy, 300,000 transitions per second. So even though one atom isn't going to transition very often, there are enough of them that you can see them everywhere. And the Parkes Galactic All-Sky Survey, which Alex mentioned in the introduction, we mapped 
the entire southern sky and looked and saw hydrogen everywhere. No matter where you look, you can see it. And that's why the 21 centimeter line can be easily detected with this very small little antenna, which sits in Green Bank by the lab. It was actually, this experiment was actually done at Harvard in Boston. And you can see sort of the rough size of that. There's the uh, student who worked on it, Ewan uh, Purcell, his thesis advisor, uh, did a lot of other great things in physics as well. But it also goes to show that, uh, as we saw with the, the science presentation beforehand, you don't have to be a professor to do great things. You can do it even as a student. Uh, and this was confirmed by the Dutch and Australian shortly after uh, that Ewan and Purcell detected in 1951. We use slightly bigger telescopes to map things now. Uh, and that allows us to observe emission to greater distances. The fundamental challenge, though, as I've already alluded to, is that in absorption you can do this to very high distances with reasonable accuracy, but you need the big background source, or the bright background source. You need a bright background source to see these things. When you're looking for emission, the challenge is that the amount of emission you see is proportional to the density of the gas. And it's proportional to the density of the gas squared, <coughs> actually. So if you double the amount of gas, you get four times as much emission. And that's great. The problem is, unlike absorption, it does depend on the distance, the amount of emission that you see. Because as you move something farther away, it gets fainter and fainter, just like a light bulb. If you move it farther and farther away, it gets fainter and fainter. But when you go to cosmological distances, when you go to high redshift, it's not going as the dis one over the distance squared, like it would on Earth. It's going it basically as one over the distance to the fourth power. So it gets really hard to go to high redshift. And so you need a really big telescope, and you need to spend a lot of time with it in order to get information. When you do get that information, you're going to get a lot more information because you can see it no matter where you look. Right? You can point your telescope at any galaxy and you get all of the emission from that galaxy, as opposed to the absorption where you just get a single uh, pencil beam through it. So how do we go about observing distant hydrogen? Well, as I said, you need a really long time with a really big telescope. And the first most distant hydrogen detection and emission was at a redshift of 0 0.18, 0 0.2 roughly. Spent 200 hours with a radio telescope in the Netherlands, picture here. And this is the map of that galaxy. It's overlaid on an optical image. You can see a nice um, faint spiral galaxy there with a whole bunch of gas around it. Maybe a little bit that's sticking down here associated with that one. And they find about 5 billion times the mass of the sun. And hydrogen, which is a pretty normal hydrogen content for a galaxy. You can see the spectrum of it on the top. And you can see that nice spike there that corresponds to that redshift. So that's a nice brute force way to do it. it took 200 hours to do it. Uh, over a wide range of redshifts, you can get even more. So a group in the Netherlands as well, led by a fellow I work with named Mark Verheyen, spent 420 hours observing two fields. He looked at two clusters of galaxies. So there are hundreds of galaxies in these fields. So the odds of detecting large numbers, more than one effectively, are greatly increased. He detected about 42 around a redshift of 0.2. This is another 5 billion solar mass detection at 0.21. You can see the little spike there uh, around 1174 megahertz, 0.21. There's a little map of it on the right, the optical image in the bottom right, and then a cut across the galaxy. So you can see sort of two blobs moving at two different speeds, which is indicating that the galaxy is rotating. And this has been done not only with the Westerbork Telescope in the Netherlands, it's been done with Arecibo, which is the largest radio telescope in the world, a uh, collecting area of about nine acres. And again, they're going out to redshifts of about 0.2. This is looking back in time about 2 billion years. Okay, Compared to the looking out at redshift 5, where you can do in the optical, or 6 or 7 or 8 even, which people are detecting galaxies at, in visible light, where you're looking back 12 billion years, this is a very small amount, but hydrogen's tough. If you want to go deeper, there's another trick you can do, which is if you observe a patch of sky, as opposed to trying to detect each galaxy individually, you can try to collect 
light from all of them and add it together. And so you get average detection. And this would be the same technique you might use in astrophotography as opposed to taking a 20 minute exposure of the sky. If you take 20, you take 21 minute exposures where you don't have to worry so much about tracking errors or things like that, you can add those images up and you get the exact same thing as if you had spent 20 minutes. Here what we're doing is we take one image for 100 hours or 420 hours in the case of uh, the Barhaya North, and we stack the individual galaxies. We take the pixels together in the image, we sort of shift them around, and we add them up. And this allows us to get a much more sensitive detection, but only of an average galaxy. And what they saw when they did this was they stacked together all the non-detections of galaxies in a cluster and all the galaxies outside the cluster. And they found when they stacked the galaxies in the cluster, they stacked 12 of them inside a cluster, they get the line on the top, and you can see it's just the waste. All the thin lines are the individual spectra, and the black line is the average of all of them. Whereas if you stack them, a similar number of galaxies outside the cluster, about 14 galaxies in this case that they stack together, and you know about them from their optical positions in the red chips. You stack those together and you see there's a little bump there, right at a zero velocity offset. So they detected about 2 billion solar masses of hydrogen on average in those 14 <coughs> galaxies. Now that could be, well we know it's not 2 billion in one and zero in everything else, um, because you use <coughs> uh, but it's some combination there. It could be a lot in one and very little in the others. It could be the same in all of them. You don't know in detail there, but you know a bit more about the hydrogen content than you did before. So there's still a limit from stacking. You can do this um, at a slightly more distant redshift. This is at 0.37, so we're looking back about 4 billion years. And this is stacked both with the images and the spectra. And so you can see the average detection is that bright white spot sitting in the middle of the image there. And it corresponds to this very ugly looking blocky spectrum here. And they detected, this is Philip Law and Company's group in Australia who did this. They detected about 4 billion solar masses in their group of galaxies. So they're picking it out in collections of galaxies, some high <coughs> detections. But they don't learn much about the individual galaxies. So there's a great trick we can try to use to go after individual galaxies. And that is basically build a bigger telescope. But in this case, our bigger telescope is not going to be building more metal on the ground. We're going to use natural ones that already exist. And that is we're going to use a cluster of galaxies where it has so much mass contained in such a small area that the mass of that galaxy cluster can actually bend the light behind it. Now, it's not a very good, it, it basically forms a big lens. And it's not a very good lens. And this is perhaps the best prop, but if you can imagine uh, one of those old, you know, glass Coke bottles that you would have gotten, I think I saw them as kids, some of you might remember them as well, and you look through the bottom of those, it's going to give you a very distorted image of things. Some patches of what you're looking at in the distance might be a little bit brighter, some patches might be a little bit darker. You're not going to recognize anything in there, you'll just see a bunch of blobs. But the bright and the dark spots, effectively, are happening by gravity in this case doing the same thing. And so in this particular cluster, this is just a random image, it's not, um, not one that I observed, those blue arcs that you're seeing are all the same galaxy that has produced a distorted image, uh, that we're taking a distorted image of, from the galaxy cluster. And it's boosted the signal of that galaxy, the flux that we're seeing in the galaxy, the total light we're seeing, by factors of maybe 30. Okay, so it's a big boost. This has been done for stars. The first galaxy uh, gravitational lenses were seen in starlight in the late 80s. People have done this looking at molecular gas. Uh, but nobody has done this looking at neutral hydrogen. And I still don't understand why. But there are two groups in the world trying to do this. Um, I'm the first one to try. I still haven't detected anything. Um, but I'm working with my students using the GBT to try to do this. We're looking at two clusters. One has a fairly weak uh, magnification. It's only boosting the signal by about factors of three. And we've got a nice firm upper limit there of a few billion up to 10 billion for a couple galaxies. Uh, at redshift of about 0.4. 
And we're also using the Green Bank Telescope to look out to redshift 0.8. So we're looking now about half the age of the universe almost. And we're getting upper limits that are pretty similar, although we've got more time to go. Uh, so we're, we're feeling hopeful. And there's another group in Australia that's trying this at the near end. So in the next year, hopefully, uh, one of us will manage to see it. The reason we're doing this with Green Bank, I should point out, is twofold. One is, and it's a very simple reason, it's one of the only telescopes in the world that has continuous coverage of frequencies out to these redshifts. That is, there's an actual camera, effectively, an actual receiver that can detect that light. Most telescopes in the world can't detect light from neutral hydrogen coming from those redshifts. It's just they don't have a receiver, right? It's like trying to take an image of red light and you only have a camera that's sensitive to blue and green. Okay, it's just a missing uh, piece of instrumentation for most telescopes. The other is that Green Bank is located in the National Radio Quiet Zone, one of only two in the world. And so the interference environment from things like digital TV, GPS, and the like is minimized. So putting these things together, mostly the stacking experiments, we get curves that look like this. You'll notice there's a few more data points here, but there's still large uncertainties. The, the two graphs here are uh, the same thing, but the one on the left is showing it as a function of redshift, the one on the right is showing it as a function of pi. And so you can just see the compression is different. Um, we still have large uh, error bars, and to improve that, we need more detections. We need to improve our surveys and get lots and lots of more detections. We're getting, talking about tens of detections here, or averages of tens of galaxies. So, for this, I want to present a survey that we're doing called CHILIES, which stands for the Cosmos H1 Neutral Hydrogen Large Extragalactic Survey. It takes advantage of a newly improved Very Large Array. The Very Large Array was built in the late 70s, and they did a massive upgrade of it over the past decade, roughly. <clears throat> they expanded the frequency range, they improved the sensitivity, and this gives us the ability now to do a redshift from to do a redshift survey from zero up to 0.4 neutral hydrogen with this telescope all in one go. We did a pilot survey of about 60 hours that went up to about 0.18. Uh, we're about halfway through the full survey now. Uh, we've got about three, 400 hours. Uh, I think we've got about 400 hours, maybe five. I haven't actually added up from this season. We should hopefully be done sometime next year. Uh, but the data processing is, is tricky. Uh, but we should have hundreds of detections in the survey. So the patch of sky we're looking at is the, a field that's called cosmos. The key aspect here is the field of view that we're observing. It's a fairly small patch of sky, if you think of it in, in terms of the total amount of sky, but it's a fairly large patch when you compare it to something like the moon. If we're mapping a size, a patch of sky that's the size of the full moon, half a degree. We have tons of data at all different wavelengths, so we know everything about the stars uh, associated with galaxies. We know about the emission from star formation. We know about young stars. We know about older stars. We know a bit about the amount of dust in these galaxies, which is really a star formation as well. What we don't know is the neutral hydrogen content. That's the piece that we're going to fill. Um, to put this in context, the surveys I was talking about by Mark Verheyen are those two sort of light blue boxes there. Our survey is going from the origin all the way out to the edge of this, this pi diagram. Our pilot survey, which I just offset a little bit it's in the same direction, goes about halfway out. So this covers a much larger volume of space than past surveys. What we see as a function of distance vertically and position on the sky, sort of as angle there, as we see these structures in space, you can see that wall that's at about 600 megaparsecs, or rich at 0.13, uh, and a fainter or more diffuse wall that's about 800 megaparsecs there. And we have detections, the detections of the red circles, the gray circles are the ones uh, that we know are there, the galaxies we know are there, but we haven't seen yet. And you know, you, we can see galaxies throughout this volume. We can see them nearby. 
the map there on the bottom left. You can see them in the very distant universe, uh, the map on the top left, and in between as well. And from our 60 hours of observing, we already have 32 detections. So we're already doing as well as the Bar Hyatt group did in 400 hours in about 60. So we're going to do better as we push this up to 1,000 hours. It, it's collections of terabytes of data, tens of terabytes of data. It takes about 10 times longer to process the data than it does to take it, um, which is not optimal. Um, we detect things both in, the large, in dense regions, uh, high density walls, and low density environments in between the walls uh, that we know that the universe is composed of. And again, we've got about 400 hours collected. This is only the first step. All of these surveys that are going to be taking place are affected by radio frequency interference, or RFI. You can see some examples here. Um, the graph didn't come out too well, it's kind of faint. But we have a mission that's coming from airport radar, airplane radar, which we certainly don't want to get rid of. We just don't want to see it. Um, but we'd rather the airplanes not crash, so it's a useful thing. GLONASS, which is the Russian GPS. Again, it's a useful navigation signal for some people. There's GPS signals in here. There's radars associated with weather and airports as well. All of that corrupts our signal and blinds us to certain frequencies. We try to flag it out or try to remove it in different ways, but it's a challenge. And this environment is getting worse with time. So it's literally this whole region here we're going to become blind to in the next upcoming decade or two as more and more things start using the radio frequency spectrum. It's not as obvious as light pollution, but it's just as detrimental scientifically. So that's what we're doing right now with Chile's, but there's two um, other surveys that are about to start, and another big one that's going to follow shortly thereafter. Uh, and these are using two telescopes, two radio telescopes that are being built in the southern hemisphere, one in South Africa called Meerkat, um, and one in Australia called ASCAP. And explaining those acronyms is tough. Uh, CAT is the Kourou Array Telescope, and MIR in Afrikaans just means more. So it's a big version of a little radio telescope they have. And ASCAP is the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder. And as that name implies, there's another telescope on the horizon that's being built called the Square Kilometer Array, or the SKA, which is going to have a square kilometer of protecting area that's 10 times bigger than Arecibo. And this will be capable of detecting individual galaxies fairly quickly out to redshifts of one and beyond. These two surveys that are being done with Miracat and Auscout will be able to detect galaxies on average at those distances, but will be detecting hundreds of galaxies in the nearby or slightly closer areas over a wider range. So this is what a little patch of sky that uh, would be imaged by an SKA or Meerkat would see. You can see the blue there is all the hydrogen that you're detecting. Uh, the red and the yellow are uh, carbon monoxide, which is associated with molecular gas. But we can see this all the way back to when the universe was about a third of its age. The survey that we're doing with Meerkat over 5,000 hours is called Luduma. Is going to go out to redshift of one. This is the graph here on the bottom left of the number of detections as a function of redshift. And so you can see tens to hundreds of galaxies out to redshift of one that could be detected with the gray histogram. And so it's really going to fill in sort of this part of the graph of what the hydrogen content of galaxies is doing. The other survey in Australia, Australia has to have an Australian theme, right? So this one's Dingo, Deep Investigations of Neutral Gas Origins. This one's a little bit shallower. It's a large survey, but there's fewer telescopes, so it's not as sensitive. But it's covering a wider area of sky. So they're going to get large numbers of galaxies. They're expecting to get sort of 100,000 galaxies across different patches of sky. But only out to redshifts of about 0.4. Uh, so they're going to be somewhat limited there. But these two surveys, um, when compared to Chile's, will provide a much more complete picture of what's been going on for the past four billion years. And then the SKA, when it gets built, probably in the next 10 years, it probably gets started getting built around the end of this decade and gets built from the 20, 2020s, um, will completely revolutionize the field and hopefully detect millions of galaxies at these distances. 
If we want to understand what's going on with uh, hydrogen as a function of time in the universe, uh, we have to observe neutral hydrogen, H1. And while we have a general idea of how it's evolving, we have a general idea of what the baryons are doing, we really lack details, a detailed knowledge of what's going on. But we've got a bunch of surveys that are coming along with refurbished telescopes, existing telescopes, and brand new ones that are really going to revolutionize this field. And I would say stay tuned and uh, listen to the news over the next five years or so. You're going to start hearing a lot about distant hydrogen detections in the universe. Thank you very much.